Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Muncie Vasic. I'm a postdoc in Benoit Bruno's lab here at uh, the Gladstone Institutes of Cardiovascular Disease. Um, and, and I'll chair our first session. So our first speaker will be Dr. Isha Jain. Uh, Dr. Jain is an assistant investigator at Gladstone uh, and an assistant professor at UC San Francisco. She completed her PhD in computer science and systems biology, working in the labs of Vamsi Mutha and Warren Zappel, where she made the discovery that hypoxia could serve as a therapy for mitochondrial disorders. At Gladstone, the Jane Lab uses a combination of systems biology, metabolism, and physiology to identify conditions that may benefit from turning the oxygen dial. So please welcome Dr. Jane. All right, uh, thank you for joining me this morning. Um, looks like I'm the opening act for, for Alan, as we'll hear from in a bit. So uh, today I'll tell you about our work on understanding how different organs adapt to low oxygen, both acutely and chronically um, uh, in the body. So before I begin, I'd like to introduce you to what our lab does. Um, we're really focused on understanding how organisms interact with the environment. And as Benoit says, we study how what we breathe and what we eat affects disease and physiology. So more specifically, we're interested how variations in oxygen levels affect progression of disease. And a smaller branch of the lab is focused on how vitamins and cofactors in our diet affect uh, physiology as well. So I won't talk about that today. The big picture questions that we ask in the lab are why is too little and too much oxygen toxic? So of course, too little oxygen is toxic during many of the leading causes of death in the US. So whether it's a heart attack or a stroke or COPD, respiratory failure, ultimately the tissue dies because of a lack of oxygen and a lack of nutrients, but we still don't understand exactly why. Uh, on the other side of the coin, we're really fascinated by studying why it is that too much oxygen is toxic, and you'll hear about this next uh, from Alan. Uh, we're also interested in understanding how the body senses and adapts to variations in oxygen levels. Uh, so of course, the, the famous oxygen sensor uh, is the HIF pathway, and the Nobel Prize was awarded several years ago for the discovery of the HIF pathway. But we think that that's just the tip of the iceberg, and there's many additional oxygen sensors to be found. Um, and we really want to understand how the body can actually adapt to these variations in oxygen levels as well. And then a lot of our efforts, which I won't focus on today, center on how we can change the amount of oxygen that we're breathing or the amount of oxygen being delivered to tissues as a unique way to treat disease, particularly mitochondrial disorders. So again, not the focus of today's talk. So before I start, I'd like to highlight the superstars that actually did the work. So Ayush Mitha is a very talented MD-PhD student in the lab who spearheaded uh, the project I'll talk about, together with Yu Yin Zhao, who's a staff scientist um, in the lab. So I'll begin by talking about why we care about chronic adaptations to hypoxia and the unanswered questions that remain in the field. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, organ-specific metabolic rewiring that takes place in acute and chronic hypoxia, and then I'll leave with some next steps and remaining questions that need to be answered. So typically, oxygen is thought to be essential for life, right? And low oxygen is typically considered very pathological. And so in this setting, we know that hypoxemia, or low oxygen in the blood, leads to hypoxia in tissues, or uh, less delivery of oxygen. And hypoxemia can result from many pathological conditions related to respiratory defects or cardiovascular disease and impairments. Uh, it also uh, takes place in states of high altitude uh, during normal, healthy conditions. You can also have local tissue hypoxia due to increased local oxygen demand during things like inflammation or decreased delivery due to ischemic injury. So again, low oxygen can arise in the body due to a variety of different insults, and it's always thought to be typically pathological. However, it is known that organisms can adapt fairly remarkably to, to high altitude or low oxygen conditions. So here is a table of the populations that exist at different altitudes. And you can see here that at 5,000 meters altitude, which is uh, you know, fairly high up there, there's over 2 million individuals that reside permanently at this altitude. Right, so here in San Francisco, we're breathing 21% oxygen, 21% FiO2 or inhaled oxygen levels. Up here, these individuals 
individuals are living their entire lives at about half the amount of oxygen um, or less, so 10% or 8% FiO2. Right? So that's quite surprising that the body can adapt permanently to this, this type of condition. And actually, it's known that lifespan tends to actually be higher at these altitudes. Some of the longest lived cities exist at these high altitudes. So the key point is the duration of the time at hypoxia that enables this adaptation. So if you jump out of a plane uh, and enter acute hypoxia, you'll, you know, bad things will happen for, for many reasons, uh, one, of, one of being that you haven't had the chance to adapt, right? However, if you ascend gradually over time, you can adapt and do fairly well, right? And the incidence of high altitude pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, altitude sickness, et cetera, declines if, if you adapt in this manner. And actually, the CDC provides these guidelines that above a certain altitude, ascend only 500 meters per day to enable this adaptation to occur. But surprisingly, we actually don't know exactly what happens during this time period, right? How does the body rewire its metabolism to cope with these changes? Just to hammer the point home, uh, this was a photo taken of a research group to make the point uh, sort of more forcefully that at eight to nine percent FiO2, again, very extreme altitude, they were playing a game of soccer, right? So not only could they adapt, but they could do high intensity exercise, which requires, of course, a lot of ATP and energy, right? again, highlighting this adaptive capacity. And not only can we adapt, but in fact, there's been about 40 or 50 studies, epidemiological studies, showing a decreased incidence of many cardiovascular disease risk factors and metabolic syndrome at high altitude. So just to summarize those studies, they have consistently observed a decrease in the incidence of obesity. And we think that this is due to decreased food intake, as we've shown in our work recently. A decreased incidence of diabetes, decreased circulating cholesterol, LDL, some question about changes in blood pressure, and then the one negative side effect is that there's an increased risk of depression. Um, and that's thought to be because serotonin synthesis is oxygen dependent, right? But many of these metabolic syndrome related risk factors actually decline dramatically uh, with altitude. But of course, these are all epidemiological studies, right? There's many factors involved. And so we set out to understand these sort of parameters um, in the lab setting. So we began by establishing a mouse model of this adaptation to hypoxia. Um, and so looking for first behavioral readouts that uh, sort of mimic this altitude adaptation that takes place. So we can do simple tests like the open field test, monitoring the spontaneous movement of wild type mice. And our moxia, or 21% oxygen, of course, they do just fine. Acutely in hypoxia, they completely stop moving, again, due to this acute stress. However, remarkably, over the course of several weeks, this uh, sort of spontaneous movement almost completely normalizes. And we can show this with many different behavioral tests, showing this gradual and almost complete adaptation at the whole body level, um, overtly. OK, but how does this happen, right? What are the underlying uh, pathways that are responsible for this type of adaptation? So we became really interested in this question of how do different organs respond to these variations in oxygen levels. So at baseline, the textbooks tell us that different organs have different fuel preferences in sort of steady state resting conditions, right? So the heart overall tends to eat fatty acids and glucose. The brain is thought to rely almost completely on glucose and to some extent ketones, but it's not supposed to eat fatty acids and so on and so forth, right? So there are these known sort of basal preferences of different organs for different fuels. However, it is known that there's a fairly remarkable plasticity that exists in our bodies to rewire fuel sources in states of extreme stress or physiological perturbation. So just as an example, in fasting versus fed conditions, we know that there's dramatic changes in fatty acid oxidation, glucose oxidation, glycogen stores, so on and so forth. As another example, in resting versus exercise is another state of this dramatic fuel rewiring that takes place with a completely different pattern of enabling the organism to survive and, and perform exercise. So we became curious, what about hypoxia, right? It's a condition that's relevant to many pathologies um, and natural states of altitude. How does the body rewire uh, its fuel preference in this setting? So we turned to the textbooks, and almost all the work done on hypoxic fuel rewiring to date is primarily in the setting of solid tumors. And this is because most solid tumors are extremely hypoxic because they have an impaired vasculature um, in the setting. 
And so based on the textbooks, we know that in solid tumors that are hypoxic, you have a dramatic increase in glucose uptake, a shift towards anaerobic glycolysis resulting in lactate production, and a massive suppression of both glucose and fatty acid oxidation because that requires oxygen, of course, uh, after the TCA cycle in the electron transfer chain. So this is what you know, was known at the time. But this sort of bugged us because you can't do this at the whole organism level permanently, right? You'd run out of glucose and you'd have massive lactic acidosis. So it didn't really make sense to us that the solution would be this simple at the organismal uh, physiological level. So we went in and started to perturb or measure the different fuel sources in states of hypoxia. We began by measuring plasma glucose, sort of simple, simple parameter to measure in the lab. And we did this in wild type mice that were either normoxic or hypoxic for different durations from three hours all the way to three weeks. And you can see this very dramatic decline in plasma glucose, both in fasting and fed states. And this is pretty severe hypoglycemia, right? Typically considered pathological in this, this type of uh, sort of dramatic change. Uh, however, our animals are just fine, right? So this appears to be almost like a healthy form of hypoglycemia which is really interesting to consider you know, when thinking of treatments for states of excess glucose or diabetes, et cetera. Okay, so there's this dramatic decrease in uh, plasma glucose levels, but where is the glucose going? So to measure this, we teamed up with uh, folks in the radiology department here, Henry Van Brocklin and Young Ho Su, and we performed FDG PET scans. And so as a reminder, FDG is a glucose analog that gets trapped in the cell, enabling the measurement of the uptake of, of glucose in different organs. And so you can see in a wild type mouse at baseline in normoxia, the primary glucose consumers are brown adipose tissue, or brown fat, and the heart. And to a lesser extent, the brain, though in humans, the brain also uh, typically is a primary consumer. And you can see that over time in hypoxia, there's overall a dramatic increase in glucose uptake, right? Maybe sort of as, as expected. Um, but let's zoom in and now look at individual organs. So the brain and the heart act as basically like cancer cell equivalents in that they increase glucose uptake pretty dramatically over time, right? Following sort of the textbook model of increased glucose uptake in states of hypoxia. However, we actually identified several organs that buck the trend and become what we call so-called glucose savers, right? Maybe sacrificing their metabolic functions for the greater good of the organism. So for example, brown fat, which is thought to be primarily involved in thermogenesis, which is a high energy demand uh, sort of phenomena, um, you can see there's a dramatic decrease in glucose uptake that's sustained uh, over time in brown fat. Interestingly, with skeletal muscle, you acutely see this dramatic decline in glucose uptake, but then this partially normalizes or completely normalizes, mimicking the spontaneous movement trajectory, right? And so perhaps these organs are sacrificing their functions to some extent, thermogenesis and spontaneous movement or, or um, sort of activity, in an effort to sustain the function of the other uh, more essential organs. Okay, so this is glucose. What about uh, whole body fat? So we can perform DEXA scans of these mice and show that there's a decrease in total fat content, sort of to our surprise, right? Because we expected there to be decreased fatty acid oxidation uh, in hypoxia. And so this is DEXA scan, and then I'm going to show a somewhat graphic image just to hammer the point home. So if you look at the internal cavity of animals, you can see that in 21% oxygen, you see all this visceral fat. In hypoxia, it's completely gone, right? So imagine if we had a pill that could do this. For, for metabolic syndrome or equivalent, right? So completely disappearing at visceral fat. We won't talk about this today. Interestingly, perhaps the opposite trend in, in hyperoxia. And we could observe this by measuring uh, individual fat pads, such as epididymal white fat as well, right? So this is surprising. Where, where is all this fat going, right? We don't have oxygen, so how are you oxidizing uh, the fatty acids? Okay, so we performed the analogous experiments looking at fatty acid uptake in different organs, again, teaming up uh, with our friends in radiology. They helped us synthesize this uh, probe called FTP. So this is an analog of pompitate, which is one of the primary free fatty acids in the body, 16 carbons, no double bonds. And similar to FDG glucose, this gets trapped in the cell and in the mitochondria as a proxy for basically fatty acid uptake in different conditions. <laughs> So you can see at baseline, again, um, at organs that we expect to be basal fatty acid consumers, like the liver and kidney, light up as expected. But we were expecting a decrease in fatty acid uptake and oxidation. And much to our surprise, uh, we see that this, the, these animals light up in uh, chronic hypoxia. So we zoomed in again. 
and you can see that uh, organs behave very differently. So interestingly, the heart behaves kind of like a cancer cell, right? I told you it increases glucose uptake, it suppresses fatty acid uptake, but that's really the only organ that acts this way. Interestingly, many of the other primary fatty acid consumers increase their fatty acid uptake chronically over time in hypoxia. And perhaps most surprisingly, organs that are not thought to be able to metabolize fatty acids to any significant extent actually massively increase their fatty acid uptake, right? So drawing your attention here, you know, again, textbooks say that brain does not eat fatty acids, right? It's glucose and ketones. So what is happening here, right? This threefold increase in fatty acid uptake in the brain. Lots of questions there. How are the fatty acids crossing the blood-brain barrier? How are they getting in? How are they being metabolized? Lots to be done to understand this pattern. Okay, but this is fuel uptake. That doesn't say anything about fuel use or oxidation, right? So we designed experiments to track the conversion of these different fuel sources um, into sort of oxidative fates. <laughs> And so to do this, uh, Ayush and Yuyin designed this experiment where they used C13 glucose or C13 palmitate and tracked the entry of these labeled carbons into the TCA cycle as a proxy for sort of oxidation of these different fuel sources. So starting with glucose-derived uh, TCA intermediates, you can see that in acute hypoxia, there's a dramatic decrease in oxidation of glucose. So again, blue means less oxidation, red means more oxidation. And so acutely, this is in line with cancer cell biology, right? a suppression of glucose oxidation. Um, and this is thought to be driven largely by this HIF pathway that's been very well studied. But look what happens chronically, right? So this pattern completely changes. We have other work in our labs showing that there's uh, a negative feedback loop for HIF. So HIF is basically off chronically in hypoxia. And very different things happen. So again, the heart somehow switches to glucose oxidation. Brown fat stays turned off, and the other organs basically normalize. Right, so these are fairly unexpected patterns based on, on what's known in the field. And the palmitate or fatty acid-derived oxidation closely mirrors the fatty acid uptake. Uh, for example, increases in brain fatty acid oxidation with the time. Right, so we think that we've uncovered these really different and unexpected patterns in fuel use and oxidation. But of course, there's, there's definitely a lot to be done. So to summarize, acutely many organs act as expected, increased glucose uptake, decreased glucose oxidation, reflecting probably anaerobic glycolysis. However, some organs become glucose savers and sacrifice themselves for the greater good, things like brown fat and skeletal muscle. And then chronically in hypoxia, the, the picture becomes very different than what we expected. The heart for, somehow acts like a cancer cell and switches to glucose uptake. However, other organs like brain, kidney, liver massively upregulate their fatty acid oxidation, right? So perhaps their local oxygen is somehow being normalized, somehow they're better at being able to metabolize fatty acids in hypoxia. We don't know why yet. And then brown fat basically still stays turned off um, and sort of sacrifices, it's probably sacrifices its function. Okay, so a lot to be done. You know, of course, this is just a first glimpse at how the organism rewires its physiology in states of low oxygen. Um, and of course, we're now interested in understanding the mechanistic underpinnings of these phenomena. So what are the signaling cascades involved in hypoxic fuel rewiring? Is it HIF dependent? We suspect that acutely some of this might be, but chronically probably very different pathways are involved yet to be discovered. We have some ideas, but still working on it. Um, can we harness these pathways as therapies for metabolic syndrome? So if we can identify the levers, maybe we can pull them for pathological states like diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Uh, all of this work was done on sort of a standard chow diet. Interestingly, it's known that a ketogenic diet is actually protective in very, very severe hypoxia and very, very severe hyperoxia. This is some anecdotal, not anecdotal, some studies from like maybe you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. No one knows how or why, so it'd be great to do these same experiments on different diets. Uh, this is very much like a zoomed out view, right? We're looking at organ level differences, but what are the cell types underlying these changes? So in the brain, which cell types, neurons, astrocytes, et cetera, are um, responsible for this fatty acid uptake and oxidation. And along those lines also, how do different cells and organs communicate with each other? So we have a new project in the lab trying to understand if there's circulating factors that are being released by different organs to communicate their field preferences in hypoxia. Um, and then finally, we're really fascinated by this trend of fatty acid uptake and oxidation in the brain, um, something that's not typically thought to be possible. So can we figure out how exactly this is happening and maybe repurpose this for other uses? So with that, I'll stop. I think this is an old photo, but thank you to, to my lab, um, especially Ayush 
and Yu Yin for this work. And now I'll hand it over to Alan, who's uh, going to be talking about tissue hyperoxia. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Isha, that was great. Um, I, I noticed when you showed one of the first graphs on, on the hypoglycemia that it dips acutely and normalizes somewhat at 24 hours and then goes back down again. Yeah. What does that mean? We don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think there's a, yeah, we don't know the answer to that question. It might be insulin mediated in those acute time points, um, but unclear. Yeah. There's also acute stress responses related to like cortisol, et cetera, that might be responsible. Yeah. Um, Go for it, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is really interesting. I don't know if you know the England inhibitors, which are being, at least two have been approved for anemia, there's, uh, and they uh, basically stabilize HIV. There's this unexpected yeah, exactly. metabolic benefit yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Both fibrogen's drug and then GSK's drug. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting in light of the metabolic. That's completely out of left field, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what to make of those. It's fascinating. So we're talking about um, drugs that basically activate the HIF response in normoxia. They're being developed for renal anemia and other indications. And kind of hidden in their clinical trial data is this observation of decreased like LDL and various other sort of dyslipidemia parameters. Um, yeah. I don't know what to make of it. You know, it's fascinating. You know, I think we've tried some of those drugs in the lab, and Alan can comment more. I don't know if we've seen as striking of a difference. I don't know what accounts for that. You know, chronically, again, Again, HIF is probably not active, so maybe it's some ricochet effect. And in that case, patients are chronically activating HIF, right? So it's different than chronic hypoxia. But yeah, unclear, but fascinating. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Uh, Nice talk, Isha. It's really nice. So I was actually interested in the last question you were mentioning about that, uh, you know, brain or other tissues, they are trying to take more fatty acid uptake, kind of. So I was wondering, like, what transporters are yeah, that's actually like, involved in us? Because yeah. blood brain barrier has lots of ABC transporters and SLCs, probably. So I was wondering if you did some RNA-seq experiments of those. Yeah. So we have done matched RNA-seq in all of these organs. Um, I don't know if that's, we could use that as a starting point, but I think that's the key killer question, right? Beyond hypoxia, are there transporters that allow these fatty acids to get in? Um, there's some old work by Harvey Lodish that someone had pointed me to recently where they nominated four or five fatty acid uh, binding proteins or uptake proteins that could be candidates. So we should probably knock them out one at a time and then see. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a good question. Uh, on this 8% uh, hyp uh, hypoxia, what is the equivalent for human uh, Hypoxia. What is the number? It's like 85 percent, 90 percent O2 oh, sat. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. 10 percent FiO2 is about 85 percent sat. So this is about a little bit lower than that. Maybe like low 80s. Low 80s. Yeah. I see. 82, 83. And then the other question I have is: Are these animals? Uh, do they have decreased intake of food? Uh, yeah. So it's fascinating. Um, so this was observed. So first of all, yes. So acutely, the mice completely drop their food intake. It normalizes partially, and we dug into it a little bit. You know, leptin might be responsible partially for these uh -huh. for these changes. Um, but this was first observed in humans in the 1920s. So there's a Harvard fatigue lab that was working, you know, for World, World War I, II, and they were uh -huh. putting soldiers in these hypoxia chambers, and they saw this dramatic decrease in food intake. Uh -huh. So, so, this how, was very so how much of those uh, uh, metabolic profile changes that you saw yeah. is due to decreased intake of food versus Yeah, the that's, that's a fair point. You know, I think the food intake normalizes within about 40 to 48 hours or so. So I don't think the chronic effects are linked to that. It, it completely normalizes. There still is that slight decrease in body weight, but I doubt that that's responsible. People have done some paired feeding experiments to try to disentangle some of these overt phenotypes, but uh, almost definitely it's not responsible for the dramatic hypoglycemia, okay. et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Great work. Yeah, I, I can just share. Thanks. Uh, so, um, I, I saw you talk like four or five years ago at a diabetes retreat, and it's uh, uh -huh. nice to see. Uh, how far you've come in the last year. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just had a quick question regarding like thermogenesis of brown adipose tissue. Yeah. Um, so, so you pretty much see like a total cessation of like, brown adipose tissue activity. It seems like so. Do you see a decrease in the overall amount of thermogenesis from these animals? Yeah. <clears throat> 
Yeah, you know, maybe looking at first just body temperature is probably what we've done, and this is at you know room temp, not at thermal neutrality. Um, so acutely, there is a dramatic drop in body temperature, and again, this normalizes on a similar time frame as the food intake, so 24, 24 to 48 hour type of time frame. Um, and yeah, so the brown fat stays turned off, so that means that something else is kicking in and fetal cycling for the chronic time points to maintain body temperature. We don't know what that is, um, and we haven't done the cold challenge yet, but we should. Does wet then beige potentially? Do you see any beijing in wet? It's possible. We haven't looked. Gotcha. Yeah. I think there's one. Yeah, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to ask about like the, just the overall like uh, altitude difference then, right? So if you have somebody going up, you know, 5,000 feet, it's much colder there, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah. How does that then reflect in human? Yeah. Things? Yeah. No, it's a good point. I mean, to be frank, I don't know if we care specifically about high altitude <laughs> physiology as sort of a way to motivate the work. So I, we haven't really looked at the combination of temperature and um, low oxygen. We're using it basically as a model to understand other pathological states of systemic hypoxia. Yeah. Thanks again.